So y'all had taught on Friday, and I understand that you all finished up the uh, Chinese Minor Theorem. So we are going to talk about rings. Now, this is sort of the last theoretical section, if you will, before we move on to uh, doing some applications and using all this. Yes. Sorry, I'm going to interrupt, but are we going to like review the homework that we talked over so that we do Friday? Oh, again, my usual traditional thing. Um, oh, yeah. Why not? Maybe we'll see if I can figure myself out here. Uh, what do you mean is my usual song and dance about what's on the homework, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know you would like that part that much, but here we go. Uh, so the first problem uh, says um, an element in SN. So what we're talking about is a symmetric group that we've worked in and done all these computations with. If it's just a cycle of two things in it, uh, it's sometimes this is called a transposition. To transpose things is to interchange any two things, right? Show that any cycle in SN is a product of transpositions. So let me remind you what I mean by a cycle is something that looks like this. Where these are all different, right? And of course, K must be less than N if we're in SN. You can't have more than N letters, right? Show that this is a product of transposition. Um, transpositions are important in the, in the following way. Um, imagine you take a brand new deck of cards. You all have all played cards before. When you buy a new deck of cards, right? Remember how you start off, it goes from ace to king, right? For all the suits. And then you shuffle the heck out of it, right? Let me ask you this. Suppose I shuffle the heck out of the deck. Is it possible for me to unscramble that, get it back to its original position just by doing transpositions, right? And I can do as many as I want. And the answer is yes, because it turns out that any, any permutation is a proper transposition. Can somebody describe to me how you might go about doing just transpositions to get a shuffle deck back into the original, say, ace through king of spades, ace through king of hearts, ace through king of clubs, ace through king of diamonds. How could you do that? Uh, right. Look at the first card. If it's the ace of spades, you're done. Move to the second card. If it's not the ace of spades, it's something else. Find the ace of spades in the deck and swap them. All right. Now look at the second card. If it's the two of spades, move on. If it's not the two of spades, find the two of spades and swap them. And would everybody agree that you can get any shuffle or you can undo any shuffle that way? And this is what this problem's about. First, show that any cycle in SN shows specifically how you can take that animal right there and write it as a product of transpositions. Show that any element in SN is a product of transpositions. By the way, a product of transpositions is not unique. So let me give you an example. There's two ways to write that, right? One, two is the same thing as swapping, swapping, and swapping back, right? So there are many ways to write transposition or write things as a product of transpositions. We say an element uh, sigma in SN is even, respectively odd. If sigma can be written as a product of an even number, respectively odd number, of transpositions. Now, this is important. You may assume that there's no 
element of SN that is both even and odd. That requires a proof, right? But it is true. Notice this element right here can be written in multiple ways, right? Or you could even do something more fancy. Yeah. Notice that this is odd by definition because it's one transposition. Let's count that we've got here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. It turns out that if you have any uh, any element of SN, if it's odd, then that's it. There's, there's, it's impossible to write as an even product of transpositions. And if it's even, it's impossible to write it as an odd product of transpositions. You may assume that without proof. Show that AN, this is sometimes called the alternating group, the set of all uh, elements of SN that are even, that can be written as an even product of transpositions, is a normal subgroup. Now, remember, there's two things to show here. Number one, it show it's a subgroup. And number two, show that it's normal. Um, but neither one of these are very difficult. And show that the quotient group, since it's a normal subgroup, I can construct this quotient group, show that this is isomorphic to the Z2 that we uh, played around with in class. The first isomorphism theorem that I gave you at the end of the section of groups will make this problem pretty easy. Uh, number two, this is a counting problem. You guys remember that after uh, that for that 8675309, the 8675309 uh, power problem, you had to know what the units and the zero devices were mod 100. Look at me, I've upped the voltage. What about Z1 million? Please do not list them, don't list them. But all I want you to do is count them. How many are there? You will find that with the Chinese remainder, or with the, the stuff that we have with the Chinese remainder theorem and the Wilson theorem and all that kind of business and the Euler P function, this is a much easier task. And number three, find all solutions to the following system of congruences, and I want you to find them all in this range. Uh, and there'll be more than one, but there won't be. Okay, any questions on any of that? I think that's it. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. And now that really is cool. Okay, so uh, here we're talking about uh, rings. How many of you have heard of this before? Uh, let's turn on. Uh, th these are basically, so let me first give you sort of an intuitive definition. Uh, these are very fast and loose, and I'll make this more precise, but basically these are kind of a step up in groups, right? Because in groups you have one operation, which we usually call multiplication, but not always. Uh, rings are mathematical structures where you got two operations. You can add and you can multiply. So think of a ring, it's a good idea think the ordinary integers, right? There's two things we can do to a pair of integers. We can add them and we can multiply, right? Uh, another thing that you can think of, and we've worked here, are Zn. You can add and multiply here, and we, we've got practice doing another one. Uh, and think of matrices from linear algebra, right? Look at the collection of all two by two matrices. Well, when I say matrices, I mean square matrices here. 
what happens when you add two two by two matrices, say with real entries, and you get a two by two matrix with real entries, and you will multiply two two by two matrices with real entries, right, and get a two by two matrix with real entries. So these are kind of some good practical uh, examples to keep in your head when you're thinking about this. So let's start off with uh, kind of the basics here. Uh, for the first definition of a ring here, um, the fact that we know what an abelian group is will make this uh, a bit uh, easier to. Definition 711. So sometimes if I'm being super explicit, I might write this all out, but usually I won't. R is a non-empty set. It's got two operations, an addition and a multiplication on it. So this will make my definition sure. So under addition, a ring is an abelian group, right? What does that mean? Well, this notice that I've tied up a good deal of the definition in this. What, what does it mean for the ring to be an abelian group? Well, it means if you've got two elements, A and B and R, and you add them up, it's still an R, right? Uh, number two, it means that your addition is associative. A plus B plus C is the same thing as A plus B plus C. Okay, what else does it mean? It means it, it's got an identity. So there's a zero, because remember my uh, operations addition, there's a zero element in R such that when you add zero to anything, it leaves alone. And everything has an additive inverse, right? So if I have an element in the ring, there's an element that I'll call minus R that when you add them together, you get zero. And it's a billion. So A plus B and B plus A are the same thing. So See, the words abelian group save me at least five lines of writing, right? So that's nice. So it's an abelian group uh, that is equipped with a binary operation. Well, actually, let me be explicit here. Another that I, I call dot up there uh, and we'll sometimes just use juxtaposition for okay so let's talk about the multiplication how does the multiplication well, number one, okay, this is something I mentioned earlier. The product of two elements is still in there. That's actually covered by uh, the fact that this is a binary operation, but I'm, I'm going to write it out explicitly. When you multiply any two elements of R, it's still an R. And, By the way, given the traditions of what we have in the past, what do you think you'd like to be true of this operation, this binary operation multiplication? Yeah, I, I want it to be associated for sure. Good. I wanted to be associated. And also, now I've got two bi binary operations, right? So I'm a kindergarten teacher now because I want them to play nicely together, right? So what do I mean by that? 
Well, x multiplied by y plus z should be x multiplied by y plus x multiplied by z. And uh, actually, that's sort of not good enough. Can they tell me why? There's a subtlety here. This says that when I multiply x times a sum, it plays nicely. It distributes, right? I better check that it distributes from the other side, too, because nobody said that multiplication works the same in both directions. So I'd also want Also, I want the multiplication in addition to play right, uh, play together nicely from the left and from the right. Am I okay with that? So, in general, so if you were to multiply this out. In a general thing, this should be uh, a so in particular. So in particular, if you had um, this would actually be a squared. Uh, well, I let me move this out explicitly. Which is a squared. You got to be careful. You know, you're used to the old FOIL formula where you get a squared plus 2ab plus b squared, but here you don't necessarily get this because there's no guarantee that ab and ba are the same thing. Right. And if you want a concrete example of where this might occur, just pick a and b to be two of your favorite matrices, and it's probably going to work out like that. So, um, what are some examples of this? Again, uh, good concrete examples of this would be ordinary integers, Z mod N, uh, matrices, polynomial rings. Um, well, like for example, all polynomials and coefficients in the integers are a lot of examples. Now, I'm gonna tack on another definition. So this, this is further modifier for a ring. So I'm usually in this class, I'm going to consider just any ring. I'm going to, I'm going to demand that it has a couple of properties that make uh, doing things a little bit nicer. Let R be a ring. Uh, we say that R is commutative. If A, B, plus B, A. And B, uh, we say that R has an identity or is with identity. The 
if there exists uh, there's a special element in R called one such that yes. So are the uh, no, well, we are going to assume that actually uh, by default uh, in this, but in general, ring doesn't. Let me give you an example. If you look at the even integers, right? Notice the even integers are in the billion group under addition because you add two even integers, you get an even integer, and so forth and so on. And the multiplication is just what you think it is, right? Notice that if you have the even integers, it's commutative because again, integers, it doesn't matter what order you multiply things in, but there's nothing. What can you multiply two by to get two? Well, the only thing you multiply by is one, which is not an even integer. Notice that that doesn't have nothing in it. However, in this, unless I tell you otherwise, you can assume both of these. So let me point out here, Remember this remark. Unless I say otherwise, uh, ring will mean um, uh, that R. And has an idea. And notice that most of the rings that you can probably think of uh, are this way. For example, the ordinary integers has one that you multiply one by anything and it leaves it alone. And Z mod n has the one bar element uh, and that leaves it alone and so forth. Okay, any questions so far? Let me give you another adjective and I will, or another type of ring that you all have encountered. Uh, I know you've encountered this, I don't know if you've heard the word or not, but how many of you have ever heard the word field? Have you heard that? The place that you might have heard it is maybe. 20 to 25 percent, you might have heard it in calculus, but it's extremely likely you heard it in linear algebra. Because in linear algebra, what did you look at? You looked at vector spaces over a field. And the field is where your scalars came from. And depending on what section you're in, you might have assumed that that field was the real numbers mostly. But actually, I will tell you what a field is. Ring with identity. So sometimes I'll write one here is a field with every non zero element of R uh, is invertible. That is, has a multiplication inverse. I mean, every element of the ring has an additive inverse, but uh, it's called a field of every non zero element has a multiplicative inverse. So, in a field, Non zero elements form an abelian group.
So here's some examples of tools. Well, one field that you encountered probably, uh, if you've ever heard that word, that you might have encountered one of your algebra is real numbers, right? And let's think about it. everybody agreed that the real numbers is a commutative ring with identity. Add two real numbers, under addition of real numbers is an ability group. We've seen that before. Uh, you also have a multiplication on the real numbers, right? That distributes, right? Order doesn't matter in the real numbers, doesn't matter what or you multiply two things, you get the same answer. And let's see, it's got an identity, namely one. Now, what do you know about the non-zero real numbers? Suppose you have alpha, non-zero real number, one over alpha, also a real number, agreed? So it's a field. That's all it means to be a field. And actually, by the way, so let me give you an entire course. We'll call this course now 3120. Everything that you did in linear algebra, almost without exception, applies if you replace the real numbers with any field. The matrices, all that stuff, which is kind of cool. You can do linear algebra over any field. Okay, well, <laughs> I've still just got one. Can anybody name another field? There you go. That's a good. One. That's a good one. Let's think about the rational numbers. It's an ability group under addition. You add two rationals, get a rational, right? By finding the common denominator, right? Um, it's got the identity. It's got multiplication. Product of two rationals is rational order doesn't matter. Uh, if you have a non-zero rational, call it a over b, where a and b are integers, right? If it's non-zero, the numerator, well, I know that the B is not zero because otherwise it doesn't make any sense. And if it's not zero, A, the numerator is not zero. What's its inverse? You get out my big guns, turn that upside down, the inverse is B over A. Everybody agree with that? So rational numbers is still too. Can you might think of an example? You don't have to get too complex. Complex numbers. Are you all familiar with what this animal is? This is a set of things that look like. So let me kind of do a little scribbles here. Set of, uh, are y'all familiar with this animal? It's all numbers that can be expressed in form of a plus bi, where a and b are real numbers and i square negative one. Everybody agree that if you add two of these things, you get a new way, you multiply two things, and you Right, I mean, if you, for example, multiply A plus B, I, and C plus D, I, how does multiplication work? This is A, C minus B, D plus I times A, D plus B, C. Right, because A, C, that's going to be minus B, D, which is where that comes from. And then I'm going to get A, D times I and B, C times I. How about the field part? I need that any non-zero element is convertible. Suppose a plus bi is not zero. And of course, this means that a uh, What it means for a plus b i to be zero is a could be zero and b could be zero, but not both at the same time, right? What's the inverse of this?
This might take you back to high school, depending on how good your high school algebra course was. I remember getting worksheets on this kind of foolishness. And what, what, what do you suppose the instructions are on a, a high school um, worksheet with that on it? Multiply by the Yeah, multiply the kind of, it says rationalize it or something, only it's not really rational. But yes, you can multiply the top and bottom by the complex conjugate. And this becomes lucky us on the bottom, a squared plus b squared. And I don't know much, but I know that's a real number. And I know that number right here in the denominator is not zero because if a and b are not zero. Notice these are both squares. So both a squared and b squared are both greater than or equal to zero because they're squares of real numbers. And if they're not both zero, that denominator is not zero, which saves my butt. And so you can write this as the real number A over A squared plus B squared is I times the real number B, negative B, on A squared. So it's a field. So because any non zero element has an inverse. Everybody okay so far? There's three of them. Actually, there's infinitely many because. It turns out you could take, for example, a polynomial ring over, just take all polynomials in R, now take its rational functions. That's a field. And then take the rational functions over that. You could just go bananas. But notice all three of these examples have infinitely many elements. You might think of a field that's got five in there. Yes? Uh, maybe I'm just remembering that. But is it Boolean algebra? That it's uh, well, not all Boolean algebras, but the smallest one is, as a matter of fact. And let me say something more general than that. You're correct. ZP is a field, right? And so Z2, in your case, would be a field uh, where P is prime. What's that now? What is it? Okay. Yes, let's investigate that. Why does P have to be prime? That's a good question. And in fact, uh, that's very astute because, in fact, Z mod N is a field if and only if N is a prime number. So, why is that true? Well, first of all, let me justify that if it's prime, it is a field. Why is that true? Go first. Uh, why is ZP a field? Well, remember the elements, let's look at ZP. Let me give you kind of a, I guess I should put more packs on this. Yeah, sometimes I'm lazy. Um, I claim, now, would everybody agree, first of all, that ZN is a ring, right? Uh, I can add and multiply there, right? It's just like the clock. And in fact, it's commutative, right? It doesn't matter what order you do it in and with identity. So the only thing left to really convince ourselves of is that everything other than the zero bar has an inverse. Now, I'm going to go through something more careful than this, but I'll tell you quickly why this is true. Remember, in Zn, you've got two kinds of things. You've got units and zero visors. Y'all remember that? Everything's either a unit or a zero visor. So everything here is either a unit or a zero visor. And does anybody remember how you tell if it's a zero visor or how it's a unit or tell if it's a unit? Unit if it's relatively prime to P. That is correct. And since P is prime, everything up to here is relatively prime to these are all units. And so units is synonymous with has an inverse. Right. Now I'll I'll remind you why that's true. Let 
k be any uh, let, let k be between zero and p and let's consider k bar. The burden on me is to show the k bar has an inverse, correct? And then I'll be very happy and I'll be in Jim's happy field land, right? Because this will be a field. Well, notice that GCD right? Because the only factors of P are itself and one, correct? And there's no way that P divides K because it's less than, uh, it's, K is less than B. So that means that the GCD and P and K must be one, right? Because P's only got two factors to get. Everybody cool with that so far? So there exists a b in the integers such that a k plus b p is equal to one. See these properties of the integers, they always come back and take care of them. Now reduce this mod p, and this means a k, or I'm sorry, a bar k bar plus b bar p bar equals one bar. But P bar is zero bar, right? Because P is divisible by P. And so we get A bar, K bar, N bar. So K bar is in bar. And hence, uh, ZP. So Z2, Z3, Z5, Z7, Z11, all of these things, right? And so you can do one in your algebra, which is really cool. Now, let me get to Emily's question because you asked, why does it have to be prime? So let's, let's find that out. So yes, if it is prime, it's a field. Why, why does this condition force it to be prime? Well, now suppose, have Z N with N not prime. Okay, so here's the way to grab this by the throat. Um, what does it mean for N not to be prime? <clears throat> That is correct. It's got a non-trivial divisor. It's got a divisor other than itself. And in fact, what that means is I agree with that. So whatever what it means basically for n not to be prime is I can break it down into two factors and neither of these two factors are all one, right? Now, check this out. So let me illustrate this. Notice you have two things, A bar and B bar in here. And notice that A bar, B bar is equal to N bar, which is the bar. So A and B are zero primes. So they can't be minus. They can't have inverses if they're zero primes. Yeah. Show that. So it is actually, in fact, it's necessary uh, for it to be prime to, to be a field. Okay. Any questions? So since they're zero divisors, they don't have inverses. Yes. And okay, let me demonstrate why that's true.
So let me let me make this. I, it's sort of implicit from what we did before because remember I said that everything has to be a zero divisor or a unit, and we were counting like they're mutual exclusive. They are. So let me let me really clean this up. Claim no element both a unit and a zero divisor. Suppose, suppose x is a unit. Uh, so there exists y and r such that x y y x. Also suppose it's a zero. So there exists a z not zero such that x z let's assume that we've got somewhere in this sort of shadow region of being both a unit and a zero divisor. Well, Xz is zero, correct? Now just multiply on the well, it doesn't matter because rings commit. You can multiply on any side by y. And notice that y of z equals zero, but this is one. That's a contradiction because we assume the z is not zero, so you can't be both a zero divisor and a unit. Any questions? Anybody want to question my proof? There's one thing that I kind of uh, assumed in that proof that I think we all will take prizes, but you might want to be careful. Anybody see any assumptions I made in this? Well, that's not an assumption right there because that has to be true. I already had that. I'm assuming that anything times zero is zero. And this is actually always true in the ring, right? So uh, in fact, I didn't break zero anyway, zero is one minus r, right? There you go. So when you multiply r, anything in the uh, ring r times zero equals zero. So there's no surprises there. Let me also, while we're on the subject of all this, before we get on to the, the next bit, In a finite ring, turns out any element is either a unit or a zero class. You actually did this in your homework in the specific case that you had the ring Zn, right? There was a homework problem from a couple of homeworks ago that says in Zn show that anything is either a unit or a zero class. If you remember that one. And you all tackle this problem in different ways. 
there's a number of ways to show this. This is not true in general. Anybody want to know what the zero divisor of Z are? So suppose I have an integer n that's a zero divisor, right? That means that there's another integer m such that n times m, another non-zero integer m such that n times n equals zero. What does that tell you about m? It must be zero, right? Okay. So the only zero divisor is zero. Right, because if you have the product of two integers being zero, one of those two has to be zero. This is not true for z mod n, but it is true for z. Uh, the units, what about the units? Which integers are convertible? Well, you're sort of right, but, but ask yourself this question a little bit. Which integers are invertible and their inverse is still an integer? There you go. The units here are only plus or minus. Right, those are the only uh, two integers whose inverses, whose multiplicative inverses are still integers, right? One half, no way, right? That's, that's not an integer. So let me point out that most of the integers are neither units nor are they zero divisors, right? Anything two or bigger, anything negative two or smaller, they are neither units nor are they zero divisors. But of course, Z is an infinite ring. Let me give you one more definition from this section. A commutative ring is called an um, integral domain. If zero is its only zero. Uh, so if I ever use the word domain, uh, it's it's called a literature integral domain, but some people just call it a domain. Uh, what it, this means is a commuter brain with identity. And there are no non zero zero divisors. So here's the important thing about domain <laughs> in an integral domain, you can do what you're used to doing in high school A times B equals zero implies A equals zero or B equals zero. That's what everybody is warm and fuzzy with, right? The product of two things being zero means one of them has to be zero. Integral domains are exactly your dream ring where this happens for you all the time. Okay, any questions? Questions on that? Okay, uh, all right, well, if there aren't any questions, then this is where we'll end it for today, and we will see you all on Tuesday.